There are many discussions about, for example, regenerative agriculture, which is mixed-use agriculture. And as Dr. Willett mentioned last night, theoretically, we're going to need to feed 10 billion people as opposed to the 7.8 billion. By the way, if we care about this planet, we need to be talking about population control, not by draconian means, but by empowering women around the world. And frankly, they should be throwing condoms out of the Pope mobile. There are too many of us. It, it, it always astounds me that there are 7.8 billion of us. It's already too many. And we talk about 10 billion as a fait accompli without saying one of the critical elements for anybody who cares about this planet is to do everything possible to support family planning by every expedient means and make sure that women around the world are empowered to have control over their own bodies, which in many parts of the world, they're simply not. In many parts of the world, for many disempowered women, birth control is hoping the guy who has control over your body doesn't show up tonight. It's about as good as it gets. We must fix that. And I think this is a critical health imperative of the modern world, but in any event, if it is a fait accompli, if we are going to have to feed 10 billion people, or even just to sustainably feed the 8 billion of us already here, there may in fact be a role for animal food. Consider, we're not accustomed to this in the United States, we don't think about it. But there are places around the world where people are overtly protein deficient, and the single most efficient way to fix that would be an influx of animal foods. And what I mean is those pictures we've all seen of kwashiorkor. They come from famine-stricken parts of the world. Usually it's the Horn of Africa in the Sudan. Could be Bangladesh. But you see these children with protuberant bellies and spindle-thin limbs. That's kwashiorkor. It's overt protein malnutrition, and it's because they only have a limited variety of plant foods, not nearly enough protein. Now you could fix that with a balanced variety of plant foods. You can get all the protein you need from plants. You all know that. You can be strictly vegan and get all the protein you need. But we're talking about fixing the problem of people who are already stunted and suffering from protein deficiency. What is the most efficient way to do that? It would probably be animal foods. Might be dairy, might be meat, might be some combination. In some ways, you could think of this almost like the discussion about, well, I would recommend this diet for someone who wants to stay healthy, but I would double down on the diet I think best as medicine for someone who already has coronary disease. Same thing here. We know we can get all the protein we need from plants, but if you've got a child who's facing overt malnutrition affecting their cognitive development, you need to fix it fast. So there may be a place in a sustainable global food supply for what is referred to as regenerative agriculture, but it's a small place. The Eat Lancet Commission report, which I certainly commend to all of you, it is a masterful scholarly look at what are the sustainable boundaries for our food supply and our many other practices. If we're all gonna stick around through generations beyond our own, suggests that the world at large needs to reduce average consumption of meat by 90%. Now that could mean everybody currently eating meat cuts down 90%, but it also might mean some people are not going to cooperate and the world would be a lot better off if a lot more of us were plant exclusive. So when you look across this expanse of what's good for my health, what is kinder and gentler to other creatures that have every right to be here that we do, and what might be the greatest contribution we as individuals and communities can make to a global food supply, it is a plant-exclusive diet. Period. We're done. If we were to make that argument consistently, and again, I'm, I'm up here pleading with you. You do it. I hope the experts do it. If we were to make that argument exclusively, we don't alienate anybody. It's incontrovertible. We don't know for sure that plant-exclusive is the single best diet, but all the evidence we have suggests it might very well be. If we impose an overlay of concern about fellow creatures and the environment, it's the only diet that fires on all three, and so it is my choice. You can fly that flag with conviction and pride, and I think it lays to rest this small diet war. And the proper place for fat in the diet if you're more likely to adhere 
to a whole food, plant-exclusive diet because you indulge in a little bit of extra virgin olive oil? Go for it. The diet that's best for people is a diet they're actually willing to live with, a diet they can enjoy. And, and let's not forget, pleasure matters. It's interesting. It can fall out of the equation. It did come back in last night when we talked about recipes. But I would go so far as to ask you this question. Why do you even care whether or not you're healthy? Why do you care about health? Do you think health is the prize? If health were just a box you could tick off, wow, you're healthy. Is that why you would care? I got to tick off the box? I don't think so. I think the reason that you care about being healthy is fairly obvious. Healthy people have more fun. Other things being equal, healthy people have more fun. Your life is better if you're healthy. Now, being healthy doesn't make your life perfect by any means, but all things being equal, healthy versus unhealthy, healthy is better every time. More energy, more vitality. You can do more of what you love to do. Spend more time with the people you love to be with. See more of this beautiful planet. Healthy is better. Health is not the prize. Owning your own life is the prize. Optimizing the quality of life, the bounty of years in it, and the bounty of life in each of those years, that's the prize. And that's the reason to care about health. So, yeah, pleasure ought to be part of the equation. The purpose of health, arguably, is pleasure. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to expunge too much pleasure on your way to health. There's a balance to strike. So if you're aiming at an optimal diet, but there's a version that you like a heck of a lot better, I would encourage you to go for it. Let's acknowledge the theme of optimal eating for our kind of animal. And by the way, folks, we are one kind of animal. We are close relatives. You are my cousins, like it or not. We have a stark reminder of that from the infectious disease scourge that's rattling the cage of public health right now. The coronavirus does not give a damn where you were born, where you live, what your skin pigment is, your zip code, your visa status, whether you're an immigrant or live where you were born, it doesn't care. We are all the same. And it's telling us something we ourselves need to acknowledge. We are family. We are one kind of animal. We can acknowledge there is a basic theme of eating that's optimal for us because we're more alike than different. And then the rest is variations on the theme. And for whatever it's worth to you, I give you my permission as a health professional to choose the variant that you and your family love best. I think everybody's entitled to love the food that loves them back.